This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Rev. Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Rev. Bill is a New Thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And you wanted to talk about new thought denominations. Yeah. If First of all, is denominations the proper term? No. Okay. It is not the proper term. But instead of trying to figure out what the proper term is and introduce it that way, we're going to start with denominations because that's what people think of it as and then work our way backwards to what it actually is. Okay. And by denominations, you're talking about the major branches of new thought, which are things like unity and the unity churches, religious science or centers for spiritual living, divine science churches. And then there's also the universal foundation for better living, which is an offshoot of unity. And then there's agape, which is an offshoot of religious science. And there are other individual ones like Hillside Chapel in Atlanta. And there are some other large ones that have made their own mark. So people think of those as denominations because they're different ways of doing the same thing in the same way that Methodists and the Baptists are different denominations of Christianity. They have an awful lot in common, but they identify themselves by what's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not one of us. (laughs) And it's so much that makes sense in each one. One of the challenges that I had was believing in one thing that was common to this denomination or identified with this denomination, but also believing in this common to another denomination and thinking, you know, there's got to be a way. What made this split in the first place? Like, did you just decide (laughs) to do this just because churches split because somebody decide they want to do their own thing And you have to create some kind of distinction, I guess, because if you're not going to stay with the whole, you have to say, well, this is why I'm different. And the differences become so, they're just not relevant to the core values or the principles, the fundamental principles. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. So you talk because I'm going to hear about that. The advantage that we have in New Thought is that we're still going through the process of divvying ourselves up and sorting ourselves out because New Thought is only 150 years old as opposed to Christianity, which is 2000 years old. And there are a lot of decisions and waypoints and detours that happened so long ago that nobody really knows why that happened. I was having a wonderful conversation with the executive director of Unity Worldwide Ministries because he was on a panel with me and we were talking about you know, what we have in common and what makes us different. And he said that there are three different ways that people teach the unity philosophy. So now that's just one of them, Mm. but there are three different ways of doing it. You know, and one of them starts with the Fillmore's who are the founders and have a really powerful story. And then others start with the metaphysical interpretation of the Bible, which is what the Fillmore's did. And they bring a lot of Jesus into that. And then the third way to do that is to be more new agey and talk about the interfaith aspect of it, because the teaching, the philosophy, the healing works regardless of what religion you're in. And that's just one of them that works in all of those different ways. Mm -hmm. So based on that and what I've seen my fellow New Thought ministers, mostly in religious science, but in some other denominations as well, is we all have our own way of teaching stuff. And if you're looking around for something and you got this person over there that's teaching it their way and that person teaching it their way and you find me and you like the way that I teach it, well, that makes me your denomination because you have a preference for the way that I'm teaching it. And that's fine as long as we remember that it's just a different way of teaching the same thing, the same principles, the same truth. 
Because, by the way, in New Thought, you don't have to believe anything because we say to believe it. We give you some suggestions that there are some things that we've observed about how the world works. And if you work them, they work. And so, you know, it doesn't matter whether you believe it works or not. It's going to work, even if it works by not, by seeming like it doesn't work. So. I was with you. <laughs> I stay with you on that. Okay. Yeah, I get that because before I met you, I had been around centers for spiritual living mm -hmm. quite a lot and tuned in in different parts of the country, broadcast in different parts of the country. And so I had a real clear, pretty clear understanding of what that part of New Thought was like. But I didn't know that there were so many others. You know, mm -hmm. I knew about unity and I said, okay, unity, it's pretty much too much like what I had come from. And I was, to be honest, to use the word that's not cool to use, but I was just afraid that if I stopped in unity, if I unpacked my bags in unity, I would not be able to see new thought clearly because it was so, do you know what I mean? It was just so, had too much in yes. common. That second yeah. one that we're talking about is the metaphysical interpretation of the Bible. You were already doing that. I was already doing that, but I didn't have a mentor to help me in area in the gray areas, you know, that I might not have even known were gray areas. So, you know, I thought, well, that probably is the best place for me to be in unity. So I'm making all of these decisions on my own. And then, of course, I met you. And this is an entirely different experience, not only in interpreting and living out, it's very experiential. Would that be a good way? Absolutely. This is the laboratory of your life. And we're going to do some experiments and see what works for you. Yeah. And I'm absolutely not accustomed to experiential learning. That's, you know, I'm just, so that I said, okay, I'll dive into this <laughs> because you've got to try different things to learn it all. Yeah, I think, you know, my suspicion is that you actually were very well served by not stopping at unity and there's nothing at all wrong with unity, but because of your background, you probably would have gotten stuck in an intellectual cul-de-sac and driven around in circles for a long time because enough of it was similar to what you were already doing that the subtlety and the nuance would have escaped. Yes. The thing that new thought denominations all have in common is that when we turn our eyes to God, when we turn our eyes to the infinite, when we turn our eyes to the infinite creative power that created everything, we close them and look within. Mm -hmm. We do not look up to the heavens. We do not look out there. We do not look longingly for someone who may or may not show up and do us a favor. The thing that we have in common is that there's one and we're it. And that creative power that creates everything, we're using it and we're creating our lives according to our beliefs. Now, there's a lot of stories about Jesus where he was doing that and demonstrating that and telling people that they could do that. And to go through the Bible and instead of having it be a book about how cool Jesus was and we should put him up on a pedestal and bow down to him, Jesus was our way shower and said, everything I'm doing, you can do. Learn how to do it. Unpack your baggage, <laughs> clear out your closet and do this. And what we're trying to do is follow his instructions and clear out our baggage and do this. Which is extremely powerful, really is. And it opens a world of spirituality, of freedom, just to put Jesus in a different light, you know, to see Jesus in a different way. That's a big challenge for some. But in the different denominations of new thought that I peeped into, that's there. You know, there doesn't seem to be any conflict there. A little heavy on the Jesus part in unity. Mm -hmm. A little heavy. And at unity, boy, the folks in unity can get themselves into trouble when they're talking to somebody who's seriously committed to one of the traditional Christian denominations by referring to Jesus as the master teacher. Like, nope, Lord and Savior, and you better shut up because I got a gun. <laughs> Stop <laughs> yeah. saying that. Stop <laughs> saying that about my guy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was talking to my husband the other day. I said, you know, I think you just like, just let this thing go because it requires a bit of, well, you called it heavy lifting, but there needs to be a willingness to say, I want to know more and looking at 
this Jesus in a different, from a different perspective or across the street and seeing a different perspective is freeing. You see more, but you know, it takes a little guts, I think. And there's probably a better word, but I think everybody understands. Take some guts. Mm -hmm. Take some guts. To challenge your own beliefs. Yep. But I, you know. Spiritual and emotional and intellectual and sometimes physical courage. But if God is God, then you're going to be okay. Like, what's to be scared of, right? If God is loving and cool as we think God is, then God can handle the questions. Ask them. Well, yeah, that's a very new thought. (laughs) There's nothing that's off limits because God's okay with all of it, you know? And we've talked about that a whole bunch before. If you could actually annoy or irritate or anger God, then you'd be in control of the relationship because you could decide when to think or say those things and that would control God. And I don't think it works that way. Uh, Well, then, you know, that kind of makes God a bit puny. Well, if I'm the one who's in control of my relationship with God, then what? where's that infinite power? Exactly. (laughs) When did God give me the power to make God angry? Exactly. Okay. I'm not in control of that. I am absolutely not in control of that. So there's two thoughts that are going through my mind. And I'm going to tell you about the Baskin Robbins metaphor first, and then we're going to get back to basics after we take a break. And this is something that came up last week. So we're talking about the different brands and variations in new thought. And my observation is that it's like going to Baskin Robbins. Now we go to Baskin Robbins. I am probably going to get chocolate chip cookie dough. And somebody else is probably going to get pralines and cream. And somebody else is going to get vanilla. But nobody is going to get cauliflower. We're all getting ice cream. (laughs) We're all getting ice cream. (laughs) Okay. We're not going to pick up motor oil at the Baskin Robbins. So which of the 31 flavors that we're choosing from, new thought is the ice cream and the ice cream store. We're all going to that and we're just doing it with slightly different flavors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And with that, we will take a break and upon return, get back to fundamentals. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy-to-understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, and here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We're going to go back to basics, right? We're going to go back to basics. We're talking about new thought denominations. And my background is in religious science, which is the one that was founded by Ernest Holmes and described initially in the Science of Mind textbook. And the other ones are divine science, which is the granddaddy of all of the current denominations, which was founded in 1888. You can tell that I just went to a Congress where we're talking about this stuff. Unity was founded a year later. And then there's the Universal Foundation for Better Living, which was founded by Dr. Johnny Coleman in Chicago and has grown Mm -hmm. into its own sub-denomination. That's based on unity. And then there's Agape, which is Michael Beckwith's work based in Los Angeles that's continuing to grow and evolve and work. And I'm most familiar with the religious science ones. There are some others, individual ones, and the Swedenborgians have been around forever and ever. We all trace our lineage, all the ones that I was talking about previously, to the philosophical work that was done by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So he and the transcendentalists thought about these ideas of oneness and what that meant, and that there's not a father and a son and a Holy Spirit in the sense of three different powers that are doing different sorts of things. There's no duality. There's no force for evil. He said there's one, and we're all using it, and didn't tell anybody how to do it. (laughs) 
<laughs> he implied that we could change our life experience through our beliefs and our thinking, but he didn't say how to do it. So, and that was in the early 1800s. In the mid 1800s, this guy, Phineas Parker's Quimby up in New England, tried it. So he came up with the technique of mental healing and he did lots and lots of experimentation and healed, I think, 12,000 people in seven mm -hmm. years. And it worked. And then Thomas Froward, who had been a judge in India, a British judge in India, when he retired, he started lecturing and writing on this stuff and really brought a lot of the pieces together. And those were the foundational pieces that turned into these new thought teachings. So we all have that in common. And oh, by the way, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a Swedenborgian because Emanuel Swedenborg had similar ideas a hundred years earlier than that. And that teaching is still around. And so we all have this in common. And what we want to do is be able to identify what we have in common and then be able to celebrate the things that make us distinct and different. And like I was talking about before, the different flavors mm -hmm. of new yeah. thought. So I was having a conversation based on the Congress that when you start talking about the fundamentals, the principles, Ernst Holmes has 11, and that's in the Declaration of Principles, which is in Science of Mind magazine, every issue. And it's 11 different things that we believe. And then Agape has their own list, but there's only six of them. <laughs> there okay. used to be five, but they added another one. And I don't disagree with almost any of it. There's one word that I disagree with that Ernest Holmes said, but we're going to let that go right now because otherwise it's just going to be a discussion. of It's going to be a disagreement between me and the founders. So I'm not going to do that. But when we started New Thought Philadelphia and focused on let's change from the language that has been to the new language, we said, this is a teaching of oneness. There's got to be one fundamental belief that we believe. So what is that? And so we discussed back and forth what it is. And the notion is, it's done unto you as you believe. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said that very clearly. Mm -hmm. And we can celebrate the fact that Jesus said it, or we can celebrate the fact that it's true. <laughs> so the way that we say it at New Thought Philadelphia is we believe there's one power, love, intelligence, or force that creates everything, including us, and that we each use that power, love, intelligence, or force to create our lives according to our beliefs. And everything else is details. Now, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of flexibility and variability in the details. And we added the word force just because, you know, starting in 1977, there was an idea of the force. And if I could use the force, then I would. And you can. It's just that the tool we use with the force is not a lightsaber. It's a prayer. <laughs> and everything else is built on top of that. And when I look through the Declaration of Principles, the 11 different things that Ernest Holmes is saying, they're all different ways of expressing, understanding, and experiencing that same fundamental thought. That there is one that creates everything, including us, and that we use it ourselves to create our experience. I remember when I found New Thought and the Science of Mind textbook, I went online and found the principles and tried to memorize them. Then when I'd look at another New Thought denomination, the principles would be different in content and number. So I was looking at the principles, trying to determine how and where do I land or fit in. I thought I had to land somewhere, but I didn't like the idea because I tried the landing thing in three traditional denominations. And I thought, I just want to know what this is. And so I looked at some denominations were very organized, you know, very, very structured and huge and had a lot of bureaucracy going on. And I thought, I know about that. I need I, <laughs> not doing that. And then it was a couple, but I chose this one because it was small and different. It's experiential. So that is out of my comfort zone completely. And I thought if it's completely out of your comfort zone, then you're going to learn. And I needed to be able to learn all of the nuances and the, you know, the whatever. So I thought it was a good place to land, but it's, it's a beautiful tapestry. And when you have something that is so beautiful, it seems like it's almost wrong to stand apart and say, we're this and this one is not that, you know? So that's why I was really anxious to hear what you had to say and what the conclusion of the matter is going to be. Yeah. Well, one of my mentors several years ago pointed out that 
if somebody's in any of the branches of new thought, they think that their way is the way, and they think that the other branches of new thought are different or got something wrong. And the interesting thing he said is, as soon as somebody's trained in a second one, they understand how exactly the same we all are. And basically, it's just whether you're going to be scooping out of this tub or that tub at the same ice cream shop. And that is tremendously empowering for me because there are people who love the Bible. And, you know, being able to do Bible study and get the metaphysical truths out of the Bible is very, very powerful. There's a lot of truth in Scripture. There's a lot of stuff that gets misinterpreted in Scripture, but that's where the fun comes in. And I actually started using more and more Scripture, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament or the Bhagavad Gita, because they all have some really wonderful things to say. And all of the world's religions have some really great holidays. New Thought doesn't have any holidays other than the solstice, and that we didn't make that up. We just kind of wait for it to show up and then have fun. <laughs> but, you know, they all have something to offer. And instead of saying, oh, that's theirs and this is ours and we have to keep that outside the corral and this is inside the corral, it's all one. We remind ourselves it's all one and that we are free to take the input and be uplifted by whatever's there. Now, if I want to take Jesus's words and use them to injure somebody, I've missed the point. Mm -hmm. But people do that all the time. Well, yeah, but I don't think that's a good idea. No, but in New Thought, you have the opportunity not to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I read something today, I think it was a post or something. And they said, can prostitutes be changed and become good wives? And I can tell you that it's something about that (laughs) that just went through me, right? I don't, I've never been a prostitute. I don't know any prostitutes, but it was a hurtful, hurtful thing to me to read that somebody would ask that question because I said, they're doing just like everybody else. You know, we're, everybody's trying to make it. And some people were born into situations where that's their only negotiating skill and so forth, but it's prostitutes and whoever else you can decide that you want to group up and hate. And I have a real thing about that because that in no way reflects God. It in no way reflects love or unity in any way. And so on this side, I say this side of the fence, I hope that's okay. (laughs) But on, on this side of the fence, you get to live what Jesus taught for real. If you think that that's important, you get to do that. If you get to be an expression of the God that you've talked about, You know, it's no more talking, you get to be. And it's one of those look in the mirror type things. You've talked all this time. What do you really think? You know, yeah. How can you even say, can a prostitute become? A person isn't defined by their job and that's all there is. I can't imagine anybody doing that, you know, because they're having a great time doing it. We do what we have to do. And it's the person that matters. And on this side of the fence, I get to be that. And that's what I'm trying to, I think is so important. It's like you get to be real over here. So with all of the denominations, it's like, well, let's go to the ice cream thing. You know? Okay. All right. It's all ice cream. It's all good. I'm a vanilla person. There is only vanilla on the planet. All the rest of the ice cream is fake. it's perfect people mixing crap in with perfectly good vanilla ice cream exactly that's my you know but at the same time you know people are having a ball and ice cream man's making a living so Mm -hmm. what's the deal you know i don't like all of that chunks and stuff in my ice cream but you do what am i supposed to do come over and slap the ice cream out of your hand that's what people like to do that's god right that's god please let me criticize your ice cream choices Ah, as though it's going to affect my life at all. And it's interesting that you're, you know, talking about the criticism of, you know, can the prostitute become, you know, a good wife? Because that's one of those victimless crimes. I mean, in the whole prostitute ecosystem, you don't find anybody complaining. (laughs) Now, muggers, hitmen, thieves. Yeah, there's some change of behavior that needs to happen. And probably for prostitutes as well. 
I, one of my daughter's friends is a sex worker and she actually loves the work and that's what she's doing. And it's different for me, but there's a way that she can celebrate her individuality and do what she's doing and live a rich life doing that. And that's fine. You know? But is it, yeah, isn't it okay? This is about unity. And I keep going back to what I've learned in New Thought, and it just is, you would think I've felt this all my life. It's about unity. So how do you stand apart from somebody else and question their, who they are? Do you know, they are who they are. Let's go with the good wife thing, okay? All right. I could be called into question on that because I can't cook a lick and I don't <laughs> like it. I've been married 42 years come December. I don't like it and I have never tried to be a better cook. And my husband does not care. But people on the outside have looked, you know, what's even the matter with you? In the churches, you know, they would criticize me for that. And I'm thinking, what does that have to do with anything, right? I do this better than this. Like, what do you care? So it's either we're going to be one or we're not. (laughs) And accept, you know, what people decide they want to do and be, because that's their contribution to the world. If you let that people be who they are, then they can make their beautiful contribution to the world. See, that was not supposed, we ain't going in that direction. We're supposed to be talking (laughs) about (laughs) About what happened because I'm so I'm still curious. Because let me ask you. So we have you have a head of each denomination. At the Congress, yeah. Yeah, and there were five organizations and ten people, nine people who were represented there because there are several different flavors of each one. You know, there's So they'll probably remain separate. Well, they're doing different things. You know, some of them like there's the Divine Science Federation which is the organizations that are doing divine science. And then there's the Divine Science Ministers Association, which is the one that credentials the ministers. And so they both have their own unique purpose and they work differently. Same thing with Unity Worldwide Ministries and World Unity World Headquarters. World Headquarters is the one that publishes the magazines. They run the prayer vigil. They own the campus and you know do things on the premises. And Unity Worldwide Ministries basically supports the field and the ministers out there who are being trained and educated and supported and running their churches and stuff. So it's two different groups, but it's two different purposes for accomplishing the same thing. You know, a couple of different people from Centers for Spiritual Living. And then you had the educators from Emerson Institute who are participating there as well, because Emerson is another way of credentialing religious science ministers that's not through CSL. And it turns out that when you dig into it, there's a pretty good reason for everything that's going on, even though you look at it and say, well, this is supposed to be oneness, and it's not. So what's the matter with that? It is, you know, it's like at Ben and Jerry's that there's a guy who's in charge of making the ice cream that has chocolate in it, and another one who's in charge of the one that has fruit in it, and another one's in charge of the one that has cookies in it. And you say, oh, well, there should just be one. Well, it's like we're, we're divvying up the tasks. We're, <laughs> we're making sure that everybody who has a preference for their flavor is going to get their flavor from somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, vineyards, there should only be white wine. No. <laughs> no, some people don't like, some people like bubbly wine. Give them some of that. It's fine. So the idea is to be able to share the gifts that come along in a way that's going to be meaningful. Yeah. And the Congress, it was just so deep and so rich and so much going on there. We just can't possibly do it all in a single podcast episode. But let us take another break. And I think that the prayer that we get to do together is on sharing our unique gifts in a way that's going to be helpful. Get inspiration in an instant. God calls are the gentle and uplifting moment of truth to help you remember that the bright light of God's love is shining right now as you. It's your God call with Reverend Bill. Start your two-week free trial today and you'll get a phone call four times a week from Reverend Bill with an uplifting half-minute message filled with insight, wisdom, story, and fun. Let your light shine. You can answer the call to listen to it live or let it go to voicemail so you can hear it later. After the free trial, your subscription is just $5.95 a month. The details are at godcall.org. 
God calls are disruptive, intentionally. Whenever you write something, put on a gold star. They take you away from your routine to remind you about the truth of who you really are. They come at random times between 8.15 a.m. and 6 p.m., so you won't be expecting them. And somehow, the message is exactly what you need to hear at the time. Magic is loose in the world. It's a moment of motivation in the middle of your day. Find out more and start your two-week free trial now. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol. You're with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We've had a good conversation. Wide-ranging conversation about new thought denominations, what we have in common, but also the different things that makes us be unique flavors. Mm -hmm. Unique yeah. gifts, talents, approaches, and perspectives. Because oneness, unity, does not mean uniformity. We can have nuance and difference. And in fact, that's what the prayer is going to be about. We're going to do a practical prayer on sharing our unique gifts and skills and talents because everybody has their own. Everybody is an expression of that one infinite creative power. Every person who exists, everybody within the sound of my voice is a child of God. And we are all exactly the same in that nature, that we are the divine expressions of that infinite creative presence, that divine creative power. And we're all put together differently. We are all a slightly different flavor or perhaps wildly different flavor mm -hmm. of that divine power and presence that is God. Yeah. So we get to understand what our gifts are and then share them with the world. And whatever way that we are called to do that is good. It must be good because, see point A above, we are all divine mm -hmm. and perfect expressions of God's infinite love. So when we take that to prayer, we recognize that there is an infinite creative power. There is that one. We call it God or spirit or nature or the creator or the divine or the big bang, whatever it is that we call it. It is that one from which everything is created. That divine power has been sharing itself, revealing itself, expressing itself and unfolding itself as all of its creation since the very beginning of time. Everything that exists is that one folding back upon itself and revealing itself in a new and specific and particular way. And that is true of me and of each one listening to this prayer. Each of us is a divine and perfect expression of God's infinite love, unique in our own way, each with our own perspective, our own timing, our own observation, our own thoughts, our own abilities and talents and skills and gifts and interests and motivations. Each of us in one way exactly the same. And each of us in our own way, unique and special. So as we open to the awareness of the gifts that we are, the gifts that we have, the gifts that we are able to share, we are guided in sharing those gifts in a way that brings uplift and good into our world, into our experience as health and vitality, as prosperity and experiences of enoughness and plenty, of love and connection and relationship with our Beloved, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our government, with our co-workers, with our clients, with our world. As our creativity, the way that we share those gifts, the way that we express ourselves in the world and, and bring newness and freshness in our own special way. The way that we connect with spirit. All opportunities to do it in our own unique and special way. To open a channel to allow that goodness to flow into experience. So each one of us right now I'm claiming this by action of this prayer. Each one of us is guided and inspired and aware of the gift that we are and the ways that we can share it. Inspired to share and bring more of that goodness and richness and sweetness and love into the world through whatever work or activity or intention that we are expressing. And that's how love unfolds. That is how good is revealing itself even more fully and richly in the world. I'm so grateful for it. I'm grateful for the willingness of each one to share, to connect, to deepen, to let go of distractions and disbelief and open to that truth, to allow that bright light of love that they are to shine. I'm grateful for the wonderful way that that light shines. I'm grateful for the gifts being shared. I'm grateful for the gifts being received. I'm grateful for the awareness of this creative process and to be able to speak this word and release it into that creative law 
and know that as it always has, it is once again saying, yes, this good is underway now. And so I let it be. And so it is. Amen. Practical Prayer Podcast with Rev. Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Rev. Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.